There we go. So we're working through chapter 10. They, this is due, I believe, Thursday. And we're doing some of this stuff here. Yes, the plants book uses the Intel format. That's one of the shots. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at it. Quick. So here's the file. And look at all this lovely stuff here. Has anybody turned around and tried to assemble this and just see if you can get it to assemble? AS, do nothing. And I'll just say out temp. Well, I'll just leave it blank and then do link. So it's gonna be A dot, oh, I believe. Yeah, A dot L. Will I be able to run it? It does not say executable, it says relocatable, which means this is a shared object. That's an old file, basically. So let's see what happens here. A dot out. And I'm simply going to call it do nothing, DN. Look at my error. It says underscore start, defaulting to 401000. You will all get that. This is the entry point that we get for our assembler. So, but it doesn't say it didn't run. So if I run DN, oh, it broke. Now you have real code with a real problem that you can put in the debugger and see why it died, okay? So let's do history here. So what did I do? We edited it compiled it, and then all I did is I said, let's take the output of my assembler and let's see if we can assemble it. Now, has anybody played with this at all? And kind of, sort of, not much. You can do this using GCC as a linker and you can get it to work a little better because GCC does this tremendous magic as it compiles things for you, okay? It actually calls the linker for you. Yeah. Uh, can we talk a little more about what linking actually is? Ah, good point. Let's put this in context of... You know how we get the .o files? This is our, our relocatable object. I can take 10 or 15 of these .o files and link them together into a single executable. And the linker takes care of putting it together so when you run it, it knows where to start and where to end. So the linking process, we have this LD command and we could make it work. It's just really, really long and gnarly. So we wanna, we wanna keep things simple and have some fun with it. But what this is doing is if I look at that now and do file on DN, it's executable static link. But when we ran it, what happened? We got a core down. It died. So there's not much in this one. There's like three lines of code and there's no stdio.h. So it's very tiny object. 
So it just blows up and it blows up over this error right here. If I do the link, there is a underscore start, but do I have an underscore start in there? No, I don't. So when you run the linker on a single file in order to create an executable, what is being linked there? What are you linking that file to? So when you're doing like what this, and let's say it worked. Yeah, for just one file, yes. Yeah, it based, think of it this way, is it wraps it with, um, in the old days, you could take uh, code like from Perl and run Perl and wrap it with an executable and run it as an executable on Windows. So you could package interpreted code. And all it did was put a, a header and footer and a wrapper around it. So it loaded into memory and fire off whatever it fired off. If you think of a, a linker as actually putting the executable bits in the right places. So when it runs, it fires it up. So if we were to take this code, let's just do that. Let's do go back up here and actually compile it without the dot S. I'll give it an object and then I'll just call this DN1. File on DN1, notice it says executable. It's dynamically linked, got all this stuff built in. Notice the library it's using. SO is shared objects. This is the, you know, and then when you build it, it gives you a unique number. Okay. So, if I was to make a change, I don't know if this will make any changes on it. No, because I didn't make any changes. So the build hash is not changed. The thing to mention about this hash, do a little bit of a side jaunt here. I'm on the Windows command line, and I can't get right, W-R-I-T-E. What did it bring up? WordPad. Word what if I created a new executable called write2, and it was a hacked version that was nefarious and mean, of the notepad file and I put right on your computer and I could embed software. The Windows kernel until recently had no ability to check if an executable was maligned or not. In Linux, AIX, all of them, all the X's, I should say, it checks this. If this is changed, it knows that it's not the same code and say, wait a minute, you're trying to load a bad copy of the nano editor. I'm not gonna let you do that, okay? So this stuff is built in and baked in the ground up. And you can turn it on and turn it off to make it more or less secure based on your application. Like you need super security on a little camera. I don't know, maybe you do. Uh, DEF CON had um, uh, an interesting hack where they took some drones and they flew it around a business building and snarfed all the wireless access points and hacked them at the same time and sent back the passwords by way of another Wi-Fi signal <laughs> so people could walk by the building and use free Wi-Fi 
like war driving. We used to call it war driving, where the vans would have the antennas on and go around and find, you know, hot spots. Okay. Little side jaunt there. Okay. But what we have here is looking for start, but in our .s file, it's a main because we we're pulling it from the C source code. Okay. So it works. So if I run it, whoops, dot slash, and then type in echo, there's my zero. Now let's verify that I am truly doing the right thing on the right piece of code here. And I'm gonna say return re, okay, recompile using the same thing. Notice if I'm not kicking it out to assembler, I don't necessarily need that line in there, okay? It's just bypassing, okay? So now if I run it and I type in echo dollar question mark, what am I gonna get? Okay. Now, let's do the same thing that we just did a little bit ago. Let's give it the S. And you don't have to, these orders can be mixed up. There's conventions, you know, but now let's take a look at it. There's our three. All right. Let's slowly work our way. Now, the um, as he works through this book, as you work through this chapter, uh, the reason I'm giving it to you is that he's kind of giving you some interesting things and explaining them of why we're turning them on. So on right now, we are going to compile off page uh, 201 here. And this is going to get to be kind of a noisy line. And I do need to talk about this. This is very important. Now, you at home, I just don't know if you can see the... Yeah, you can. That is a slash, backslash, whatever you want to call it. That has very special meaning in just about every programming language I've ever touched. It's called the line continuation character. So what happens is he uses this in the book and he doesn't tell you what it is. It's one of those things you're just expected to know. So what is this slash? Do I need to type it in? No. It's so you can wrap things to make it look pretty. So let's use that as an example right here. Whoops. <laughs> Do that again. Yeah. Notice how my prompt changed. This is telling me that I don't have a complete valid syntax. So now I can type in do nothing C dash F and the command will run. When I hit up arrow, where did that slash go? It ignores it. The thing with line continuation character is it works the same everywhere, as far as I know. Continuation character, enter. No spaces, no characters. So if you put in a space, let's, and if I do something like this, 
very hard to see this. And then I fat finger it and I put in a space and hit enter. It won't work. It will give me an error. This will give you an error in your code as well, in your shell scripts. Um, it, this is in all the languages um, that I've ever worked with. That line continuation character is special. Okay. So when you see it in writing, it's just meaning go along to the next line. In other words, it's not the page isn't white enough to put in all that in. But how many knew this before tonight? Okay, one. Okay. So that tells me somebody's been bit by this more than once. And, you know, I remember stuff like this because I keep tripping over this myself. You know, it's it's what happens in life. You, you forget the simple stuff. All right. That line continuation character. So what are we doing? So what I want to do now is compile some assembler with some flags. Okay. And in the book, it actually shows it's got a line continuation character right there. So I can continue this line. And you can do it again. You can do this uh, as far as you want to go. Okay, so what are we doing here? Well, this particular command line, I'll let you read through the chapter. It's turning off some of the advanced compiler suite flags that give you optimizations on this fancy Intel 64-bit architecture. Okay, so would we notice performance hits? Yes, if you were building up something really, really big and massive, like Canvas, all in C, yeah, you'd probably see some performance hits if you were doing this sort of thing. But you wouldn't be writing this in Canvas. You wouldn't be writing C for Canvas. <laughs> Let's hope not anyway. Okay. All right. So what this does is... Let me do this real quick. I'm going to do new terminal. And I'm going to copy this do nothing S to do nothing prog1.s. Okay. Saving a copy. That's all I'm doing. Out over there. So now this is going to regenerate the do nothing S. And now I'll take a look at that one. It's a lot shorter. Where did all those stanzas go? Well, we turned them off. Okay our code is getting a little closer to where we can actually use it. We can actually turn around and assemble it and run it. Okay. But notice it's a lot easier to read now. There's a lot of things that are taken out. Okay. This is more human readable. And then as you walked through the advanced, we're taking out the, um, the advanced directives. And then he comments on this and he says, I don't know why they have this. He says, I have no idea why they have that. He's, you know, he wrote the book and he even admits it. So, so basically what he's getting at here is he tells you things when you read through this, 
he will show you what you don't need. This isn't a directive that we don't need. We don't need the file directive. We also don't need ident and section, okay? All right. All right, and there is main, limited memory, and then he explains about the size. He says we don't technically need it. So we see. now we have our .s file here. It's I actually don't need that. So let me delete that. Okay. On memory constrained systems, you might need dot size. Okay. So we now have minimal code to give us what we need to write assembler. This is the assembler code that does the equivalent of the do nothing C, returning our three. Okay. okay, and you know, you get used to one or the other, and now all we have to do is kind of play around with this and see if we can get it to uh, do its thing. So there it is. So now I'm ready to try, let's assemble this thing. Let's see if we can actually get it to assemble. But before I do that, let's use this command called diff, do nothing.s and do nothing prog1.s. This shows you all the lines that are different. This diff command is how you can check code to see where things are different. And it's telling you which file has what in it by these arrows, um, columns, rows and columns, they all mean something. Okay. Basically, you can see where things are different. Okay. You can also see that it's bigger. <laughs> Not by much. Go. Oh. Let's see, how do I want to? Back here. I finally got some terminal emulators to behave, make life a little bit easier. Been battling VNC and Spice and RDP. Oof, I'm losing. Now, we are going to, we can do this with uh, GCC, but we're going to try it with the assembler and then the linker and see what the differences are, okay? So we'll do a straight assemble here. And we want the smaller of the two. Say do nothing. Okay. So there it is. We'll do a file on DN here. See what it is. Relocatable, not strip. But now let's try to do the link. I guess I should have put a dot O on that. Let me do that. 
put a dot O on that. Now when I do the link, Oh, LD, sorry, not link. So it's still giving me the error. What's the likelihood this is going to work? What do you think is going to happen? Core down. Now let's do this same thing, except I'm using AS. Oh, I've, I'm going to use GCC. And I forgot a flag. <laughs> and I can't remember on, you know, MASM. Maybe we have to run MASM. But anyway. Everybody tracking what I just did. We did C to assembler. And we looked at the big old long list thing and we tried to assemble it and it didn't work. Didn't work out. And then we shortened up the code by turning on or off some of the advanced features in the compile line, the async. It created a much smaller .s file. And then we deleted four lines as per the book. And then we tried to assemble it. And what do we get? We got another core done. But then when we use GCC, it worked. So it would be interesting, don't you think, to um let's call this this one being two make sure it works right no three now let's do that assembler line again Now, I have DN2 that works and DN that doesn't. Quite a bit of difference in size. Well, there's a command in Linux that we can use that comes in pretty handy. It's called strings. And it says, just find ASCII you know, a one through nine and a through Z and see what it says, strings on DN. That's what it's got in it. Strings on DN too. Wow. There's a lot more in there. Significantly so. Let's do file on DN and file on DN too. Quite a bit. So let's make an assumption here. When I ran the linker, this one, something is missing. Did we link to this library? Mm -hmm. That's why we're getting a cordon. There's some stuff in there that needs to be there, but we didn't put it there, so it's going to just dot. Okay. Now, 
the pieces of the puzzle that we're building is the stuff that will be practical for you in your day-to-day -day job. Actually turning around and writing low-level assembler to get an extra clock cycle or two, there may be a case for that. Like if you're doing embedded systems or you know, really high performance heart and lung machines or something, there may be a need for that kind of thing. But if you're working in finance or you're working in, uh, you know, at Foster's or Gallo, you're probably not. But knowing what's going on when you link your files together, that is going to make a difference because you'll be given libraries that you don't know anything about. Google's going to say, here's your, here's your data validation routines. Use them. So you're just going to plug them in and compile them and hope to God they work because that's part of the process. They don't want every programmer to reinvent the wheel to do things like dated validation 75 different ways or 100. Okay. All right. Interesting, isn't it? The GCC handles all this for you. Now, there's some fun things we can do with GCC. Uh, I believe it's V. Dash V. <laughs> Means verbose. Tell me, GCC, what you're really doing. And it will tell you all the steps that it's doing in your code. All kinds of interesting things here. Now it says Ubuntu 11, but I'm on Ubuntu 22. What does that 11 mean? It's the version of the CC compiler. So it's GCC version 11. Okay, they compiled all this. How would you like to remember all these lovely, this is what linking did. So GCC adds a lot of magic. Now, could we maybe steal some of these command lines and put them on AS and see if we can link the file? Maybe, maybe not, okay. So it shows you the path, all kinds of things it's doing, okay? And then it just creates it. And notice it does the architecture, the tuning is generic, so on and so forth. Okay. All right. Professor, could you add the same uh, dash B to AS, like the AS command line? You can. And to the linker. doesn't give you much because there's not much in there. As say it just tells you, mm, not much there. Um, now, if we, what if we took that code and changed it to start? Would it still work? Could we get it to work? Probably not because there's this big old library we didn't link in, huh? So there's some pieces in the linker that we are leaving off using assembler. And this is why using GCC as the linker for assembler kind of gives you some shortcuts. So you don't have to learn 85 long miles of flags. Okay. So we have actually done a an assembler program now and they he walks you through what each one does and explains um information okay but what we are going to do next is this part is all right, let's make sure I get the right one. 
Yeah, order on it. Yeah. So I'm basically walking through this. So we saw it work. We know it works. I'm now up on page 210. I'm going to be taking the same code, but using this flag. G S tabs. Dash O and we'll call it do nothing. Dot O with our infamous do nothing dot S. So now I've created a new file, the do nothing dot O. Now I'm going to use the GCC as the linker rather than LD. But what did we actually do here? We did assemble it. We did assemble the file, but we used GS tabs. What's that going to do for us? Remember the dash G option in GCC that gives us our debug symbols? Well, this is how we get debug symbols using AS, okay? Now, what we get to do is play with it. But first thing we have to do is we have to set disassembly Labor. Now we can say run and then this is on page 211. I think we got this far to enable. And then he just walks you through it. You kind of do your thing. Okay. Now, this is walking through the exercises. I was a student for 35 years. And I learned how to take a lot of shortcuts. I get an assignment. I read the questions first. Then I go back and read the chapters to get the information I needed for the questions. That works great. History, business, law, you know, things where you have to write a lot. Not so much for calculus, okay? Didn't work too well for, you know, things like advanced physics. This is one of those disciplines, picture a guitar, Here's your final performance. Okay, I got it. Okay, now I'm gonna practice just what I need to get to the final performance. Ain't gonna happen, is it? So think of this as much more like music than you know history or something, is that if you go through the process of walking through these steps, it does help your retention and your uh, learning. A few other things about learning and focusing. Uh, get rid of distractions. I, when I'm doing some hard, you know, like certification tests, I'll chew gum and wear earplugs. And then I'll read the questions under my breath 
so I can actually hear it auditorily just under my breath, not loud enough to bother the people on either side of me. But then you're listening as well as reading. And then you can focus in on it. And you really have to work on your breathing. <laughs> you're not going to learn anything with your panting. And your breathing should be nice and deep, long and slow. Okay. That will help you learn stuff. Okay. Now, what I want to do is walk through a couple of things that he has at the back. Because what you'll be doing is there's this thing called your turn. It's where you get to do something. Okay. And it says, write three assembly language functions that do nothing but return an integer. They should each return a different non-zero integer. Write a main function in C that tests your assembly language functions and prints out the function's return values by using a printf. So we're creating an assembler that returns, just like what we just did. And then we're writing C that's going to call that particular function. Now, what I'm going to do is walk through this for one of these, because that gives you a really good handle on where the assignment's going, okay? And then I'll show you what you need to add. Because remember, this is kind of the Lego block approach to learning coding, uh, but what we're learning is some of the bigger pieces of how all this magic works. How many have compiled anything from source code other than hello world, you know? Any significant, okay, like like a database program or like downloading Python and compiling it for your architecture. The big make files, they run. It takes you know, sometimes 20 minutes to get your compile done. There's a lot of magic happening on that. And when you're working on big systems, you're going to have to know it too, okay? All right, so say next. So it's here we go. And I'll just exit. Okay. So in chapter 10, let's see if I want to create another directory or not. Um let's see. Let's see. Yeah, let's do this one. How many remember foo and foo.h and yeah, way back to ancient history. We are going to be revisiting that right now in a slightly different format. That's same kind of code, not doing anything except returning something, okay? And I think I will make a new directory here. I'm typically gonna call it F. Oops. <laughs> okay. And the question in the book, it says, write the following C function in assembly language. So it's f dot c int f void return zero. Sound familiar? Okay. So let's write it in C. And my convention, take it for what it's worth. And we don't need any libraries. No, 
We'll just follow the, the book for the time being. All right, so this is a this is our function, okay? So basically what we're going to do is what we just did. We're going to compile to assembler and turn off all the magic and look at it by hand and turn it into its very own assembly language header. And then we're going to put it into our code and call it, okay? So we'll be walking through this process. So this is basically question three on page 217. And your homework is to do the your turn exercises out of chapter 10. They, they aren't hard if you take your time with the chapter. This I reason I jumped in at chapter 10 is that this is his first. He's talking about the assembler stuff. All other the previous chapters are talking about the digital logic and Boolean and all that good stuff, uh, which we're gonna forget anyway. But knowing how to link and create a header, yeah, you're gonna need to know that. Okay. So here it is. Now let's see here. And I need my uh, let's see cat. Same idea. Okay. Let's see here. There's this. No, I forgot to write down. Some of the, so we'll do this. So we will take our GCC and give it, turn off all optimizations, give us all warnings. Let's make them MASM Intel. Create some assembler. We'll say F no async synchronous unwind tables. And he explains what unwinding tables do. Uh, it's stuff that's been put into the new chips. F C F So I'm in a new directory. And here's my S. So what do we not need? The dot section, uh, dot ident, the dot side. We don't need line one or the last three. This gives us a workable assembly function, okay? And here's the part that leaves some assembly required, pun intended, is, remember foo.h, that funny thing when it had the funny directives in it? Let's create a header. Oops, that won't work. This is simply f.h. And all it does is return zero. So it's going to do the same thing. But the h has a bunch of directives in it that tell the compiler how to bring it in and use it. 
Okay. So. And you will find that naming is kind of important. That's our header, okay? And I'll just add that for knowing it's the end here. So this is our header saying, okay, we are going to, if in def define, this is, we're saying f for void for our function and end if. These are preprocessor directives. You can do massive amount of work in your preprocessor directives, way beyond the scope of this class and most four-year degrees, um, unless you're doing kernel development or something like that, or writing new tool chains for C++. Need to know it's there, not necessarily need to know how, how to make it all work, okay? All right. Now, how do I write C code to call this? That's next. Okay. Can I see the header file one more time? Pardon? Can I see the header file one more time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oops. VI header. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't care if you take pictures. <laughs> it's just sometimes hard to see on your camera unless you get a really good uh, camera phone. And so f dot c is just returning zero again. Okay, that's all this is doing. It's returning a zero. It's just we are kind of doing some oddball stuff to it, and we will change it to another number again. And then this will give you a clue to how to get questions four and five answered. Okay. I'm giving you the pieces you need to put this together. All right. So we have f.s and we have f dot h and this is the original code from c that we use to generate the assembler we're not going to use that anymore we're going to create another piece of code where we want to say test f except i don't like using the word test for code because you can see it's a reserved word in Linux, Unix, Mac. Couldn't tell you on Windows. So we don't really want to do that. But since I'm following his book, he calls it this. Okay. Basically, what is this doing? It's testing the F function. Okay. Now, in order to include a header, I have to tell the compiler, we're going to do headers now, and I have to have this one.
And the convention is, if you create your own header, what do we put it in? Pointy or? Uh, yeah, we go. Air quote. And what do we call it? F dot H. Is the color coming through in the back? All right. And I'm ready for the meat of the C, C code here. So I'm ready to do this thing. Pretty clever. Well, oh, give it one more. Yes. Uh, you forgot an R in the return value at the end of printf. Mm -hmm. Return. Yeah, I did. Re that would not compile, would it? Return. Returned. Okay. All right. So what are we doing here? We're setting up a variable called return value. We're setting it to be an integer. Box. Okay, now I have my box. I'm going to take function f and throw it into that box. And then I'm going to print dollar sign i. What is that? Integer. That's our integer. Okay our return value. So what do you think it should print once we get it all working? Yeah, zero. And we'll change it, recompile, play with it. Okay. So. So currently this isn't going to be using the .s assembly file that. The what? Will this be using the .s assembly file? Wouldn't it just use the .c file instead? Um, I can remove C, it. Sorry. I can remove it. Okay. Because the the compile line requires you to put the .fs on the line. Because if you leave it off, I think this is this that's the line I forgot. I I did this at home, and. It's on a different machine with a different history, so I forgot to get it. So let's use zero optimizations. Oscar zero and wall. We can use all the other ones, but let's not worry about that right now. Let's take Test F dot C. I'm going to try it all by itself and see what happens here. We'll call it hmm, test F. Hmm. 
Yeah. Let's go with Stop. Now, what's happening? Well, I have a header that's in my C file that's calling the S file, but the S file has to be on the compile line so the compiler knows what to do with it. Otherwise, the links, it won't know what to do with it. So this worked, okay? And I just changed it from zero to seven, and it returned seven. Now, if I type in echo dollar question mark, it looks 127. That's probably because I did an error. <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah. You know how we put the return zero at the end of our code? That's this line. Okay. Clear as mud, huh? But basically, we're putting together blocks that kind of, once you know how they all fit together, it kind of will make sense, okay. So what's the process to write an assembly function that returns a single digit? And then make it part of a bigger program that calls three different subroutines that print three different digits. You create another dot H and another dot S, and then you keep adding to your print F line. Gonna be lazy here. Since that's an init, this is an init. Is F already an init? Okay, let's try something. Let's see what happens. Oops. What's my what's my error? Wrong character for content. Right. I was working in Bash and Python today, so I'm using the wrong comment character. So let's fix it. So I don't confuse myself again. Why that work? This much you really should know. You should really understand this as functions and how we're using functions. Because what about what did I do? I simplified the code, but the function is still doing its thing, right? Well, up here, I'm declaring a box. It's just a value. It's an integer box. 
And then I put the return value of f into that box. And then when I print return value, what's in the box? What's in f? What did I do here? I removed those extra little pieces. So now it code is shorter. Is it more intuitive? Not really. You can be so clever, you confuse yourself. It's okay to add variables so you have more places for the debugger to inspect. This is something I, I tell people when they're working in C++. When in doubt, create another variable. Just so you have more stuff to check, okay? Because you can do this all on one line too, you know, with your init value equals F blah, um, like in C++. But I wanted to show you this. This difference between these lines here and this line here, is pivotal if you, you being a successful programmer. Functions and how they pass and move things back and forth, you just got to know. Okay? And if it's a little foggy, play with it. This particular exercise in the book, you're going to get to do it a few more times. Okay? And I think what I'll do is I'll walk through the process of doing um, a character, I guess. Which one do I want to use? Let's go back to our It's a great question for a test. Right. You think we could copy this and make a few changes? and have it return a special character. And I think what I'm, see, they say, this could be any three using a print F, nothing but return a character, nothing that return an integer. So we've done the integer. So what we're going to do here is we'll do this to create a character. So again, I'm walking through one of the answers that's going to be part of your homework. Okay. And since it's, I'll just leave it here. Okay. So what I want to do is start with the obvious is let's say copy F dot S2. Let's call it tilde. And the way tilde is going to work is I want to change the name from global F so I know what I'm working on. Use some clever naming conventions here. <laughs> So 
Oops. That should be quote, tilde quote. Quote, tilde quote. All right, there we go. That's a single quote by the return key. That is not the grave mark, which is over by the escape key. Okay. And then it ends the same exact way. So what have I done to the, my code? Not a whole lot. I changed what's returning through ESX. I'm just giving it my character. And I'm giving it a descriptive name. Could I call it F? Yeah. But then I'm going to have F calling F calling F. So which F am I going to call? That gets a little confusing. So use some clear naming conventions here. And now I need something for the header, don't I? Whoops, needs to be uppercase. If I got that right. Tildy, 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 go. So here's my header. And my tilde is in assembler. And then I'm ready to do a piece of code. Test F, copy test F to test harsh. Now, this is where it makes more sense. And let's have it return one. And then what you'll do is add return two, return three. And adding a character for each time you do this. Now this is helpful. I'm giving this to you so you don't have to spend 15 hours looking up the print F statement to get your C. That's how you print a character. So can you kind of see where we're going with this? You're going to create two more header files. 
two more assembler files with some different characters in it. You can call it plus sign, minus sign, exclamation point, whatever you want, okay? And then you will add a return one, return two, return three. Then you're going to add dollar percent C, percent C, and to see where you can assemble this together. That's the goals. Here's the starting point. Let's see if you can get to the next step. Okay. Now, what's the compile line look like? This is why in the book he talks about using a make file because as you keep building this stuff, it gets easier and easier. And I will come back to make files eventually. Um, but basically, now I'm ready to go. And all I have to do is this. Am I going to have success? I always say no on the first time. <laughs> it never works the first time. No. Well, it did work. All right. Let me put that up on the screen. Cat test cars. Okay. That's part and parcel of what we just did. Okay. And then let's look at header and dot app. Now, if this was for real, I would probably add a lot more comments to this just so I could remember what's going on. What did we do tonight? Ancient history. We took some C source code, we compiled it to assembler in MASM format. And we threw a couple GCC lines, the un, no unwind, and what is the other one? FCF protection equals none, no asynchronous unwind tables, turned off all optimizations, and got an S file. And we deleted the first line and the last three lines. Created a header file. Wrote a C program that calls our function. And it worked. A couple of steps in there I probably didn't mention. So here's the history of everything we did. So we tested. When we compile, do we need our assembler on the line? Yeah. 
Yes, we do. And notice, even though this is in MASM format, it still took it. And so the compiler's pretty smart. Okay. And that all works. Tell the characters. Okay. Is there something that needs to be on the screen so you can? We're good. Okay. Now everybody's brain is full. <laughs> Okay, I will stop the recording.